In this and the next video, I'd like to tell you about one possible extension to the anomaly detection algorithm that we've developed so far. This extension uses something called the multivariate Gaussian distribution. It has some advantages and some disadvantages, and uh, it can sometimes catch some anomalies that the earlier algorithm didn't. To motivate this, let's start with an example. Let's say that our unlabeled data looks at what I plotted here, and uh, I'm going to use the example of monitoring machines in the data center, monitoring computers in the data center. So my two features are x1, which is the CPU load, and x2, which is maybe the memory use. So if I take my two features, x1 and x2, and if I model them as Gaussians, then you know here's a plot of my x1 features, here's a plot of my x2 features, and so if I fit a Gaussian to that, maybe I'll get a Gaussian like this. So here's p of x1, uh, which, is, uh, which depends on my parameters mu1 and sigma squared 1. And uh, here's my memory use. You know, maybe I get a Gaussian that looks like this. And this is my p of x2, which depends on mu2 and sigma squared 2. And so this is how the anomaly detection algorithm models x1 and x2. Now, let's say that in the test set, I have an example that looks like this. Right, the location of that green cross. So the value of x1 is about 0.4, and the value of x2 is about 1.5. Now, if you look at the data, it looks like you know, most of the data lies in this region. And so that green cross is pretty far away from any of the data I've seen. It looks like that should be raised in an anomaly. Right? So in my data, in, in my uh, in the data of my good examples, it looks like you know the CPU load and the memory use they sort of grow linearly with each other. So if I have a machine using lots of CPU, you know, memory use will also be very high. Whereas this example, this green example, it looks like here the CPU load is very low, but the memory use is very high. And I just have not seen that before my training set. It looks like that should be an anomaly. But let's see what the anomaly out detection algorithm will do. Well, for the CPU load, it puts it at you know, around there, 0.5. And it's reasonably high probability is not that far from other examples we've seen, maybe. Whereas um, for the memory use, I guess the point is 0.5. Whereas for the memory use, it's about 1.5, which is there. Again, you know, it's, it's out towards the tail of the Gaussian, but the value here, the value here, is, is not that different from many other examples we've seen. And so um, P of x1 will be pretty high, reasonably high. P of x2 will be reasonably high. I mean, if you, if you look at this, plot, right? This point here doesn't look that bad, and if you look at this plot, you know, across here, doesn't look that bad. I mean, I have had examples with even greater memory use, or with even less CPU use, and so this example doesn't look that anomalous. And so anomaly detection algorithm will fail to flag this point as an anomaly. And it turns out that what our anomaly detection algorithm is doing is it's not realizing that um, this blue ellipse shows the high probability region. Instead, what it thinks is that examples here are high probability, and examples the next circle out are somewhat lower probability, and examples here are even lower probability. And somehow, you know, things that are green cross there is pretty high probability. And in particular, it tends to think that you know everything in this region. Uh, everything on, on the line that I'm uh, circling over has you know, about equal probability and it doesn't realize that um, something out here actually has much lower probability than something over there. So in order to fix this, we can, we're going to develop a modified version of the anomaly detection algorithm using something called the multivariate Gaussian distribution, also called the multivariate normal distribution. So here's what we're going to do. We have features x, which are in Rn, and instead of modeling p of x1, p of x2 separately, we're going to model p of x all in one go, so model p of x you know, all at the same time. So the parameters of the multivariate Gaussian distribution are mu, which is a vector, and sigma, which is an n by n matrix called a covariance matrix. And uh, this is similar to the covariance matrix that we saw when we were working with the PCA, with the principal components analysis algorithm. For the sake of completeness, let me just write out the formula for the multivariate Gaussian distribution. So we say that probability of x, and this is parameterized by my parameters mu and sigma, but the probability of x is equal to, um, once again, there's absolutely no need to memorize this formula. You know, you can look it up whenever you need to use it, but uh, 
this is what the probability of x looks like. Transpose sigma inverse x minus mu. And um, this thing here, the absolute value of sigma, this thing here, when I write this symbol, this is called the determinant of uh, sigma. And this is a mathematical function of a matrix. And uh, you really don't need to know what the determinant of a matrix is. But uh, really, all you need to know is that you can compute it in octave by using the octave command det of you know, sigma. Okay? And, and again, just be clear, right? in this expression, these sigmas here, these are this n by n matrix. This is not a summation. Uh, you know, the sigma there is an n by n matrix. So that's the formula for p of x. But more interestingly, or more importantly, is uh, uh, what does p of x actually look like? Let's look at some examples of multivariate or uh, Ga Gaussian distributions. So let's take a two-dimensional example. So if I have n equals 2, I have two features, x1 and x2. Let's say I set mu to be equal to 0 and sigma to be equal to this matrix here with 1's on the diagonals and 0's on the off-diagonals. This matrix is sometimes also called the identity matrix. In that case, P of x is, will look like this. And what I'm showing in this figure is you know, for a specific value of x1 and for a specific value of x2, the height of this surface gives the value of P of x. And so with this setting of the parameters, p of x is highest when x1 and x2 equals 0. So that's the peak of this Gaussian distribution. And the probability falls off with this sort of two-dimensional uh, Gaussian or this bell-shaped, two-dimensional bell-shaped surface. Down below is the same thing but plotted using a contour plot instead, or plotted using the different colors. And so there's a heavy, intense red in the middle corresponds to the highest values, and then you know, the values decrease with the yellow being slightly lower values, the cyan being lower values, and this deep blue being the lowest values. So this is really the same figure, but plotted, you know, with from, viewed from the top instead, using colors instead. And so with this distribution, you see that it places most of the probability near 0, 0, and then as you go away, as you go out, go away from 0, 0, the probability of x1 and x2 goes down. Now, let's try varying some of the parameters and see what happens. So let's take sigma and change it. So let's say sigma shrinks a little bit. Sigma is a covariance matrix, and so it measures the variance of the variability of the features x1 and x2. So if you shrink sigma, then what you get is that the width of this bump diminishes, and uh, the height also, incre also increases a bit, because um, the area under the surface is equal to 1. So the integral of the volume under the surface is equal to 1, because uh, probably distribution must integrate to 1. But so if you shrink the variance, you know, it's, it's kind of like shrinking sigma squared. You end up with a narrower distribution, and one that's a little bit taller. And so you see here also the uh, concentric ellipses have shrunk a little bit. Whereas in contrast, if you were to increase sigma to 2, 2 on the diagonal, so this is now 2 times the identity, then you end up with a much wider, a much flatter Gaussian, and so the width of this is much wider. This is hard to see, but this is still a bell-shaped bump that's just flattened out a lot, and it's become much wider. And so the variance here, the variability of x1 and x2, just becomes wider. Here are a few more examples. Now let's try let's try varying one of the elements of sigma at a time. Let's say I set sigma to uh, 0.6 there and one over there. What this does is this reduces the variance of the first feature x1 while keeping the variance of the second feature um, x2 the same. And so with this setting of parameters, you can model things like that. x1 has smaller variance and x2 has larger variance. Whereas if I do this, if I um, set this matrix to 2, 1, then you can also model examples where, you know, here looks like x1 can have take on a large range of values, whereas x2 takes on a relatively narrow range of values. And that's reflected in this figure as well, where, you know, the, the distribution falls off more slowly as x1 moves away from 0, but it falls off very rapidly as x2 moves away from 0. And similarly, if we were to modify this element of the matrix instead, then similar to the previous um, 
slide except that here we're you know playing around here we're saying that uh, x2 can take on a very small range of values and so here this is 0.6 where notice now x2 tends to take on a much smaller range of values than the original example whereas if we were to set sigma to equal to 2 then that's like saying that x2 you know has a much larger range of values now, one of the cool things about the multivariate Gaussian distribution is that you can also use it to model correlations between the data. That is, uh, you can model, use it to model the fact that x1 and x2 tend to be highly correlated with each other, for example. So specifically, if you start to change the off-diagonal entries of this covariance matrix, you can get a different type of Gaussian distribution. And um, so as I increase the off-diagonal entries from 0.5 to 0.8, what I get is a distribution that's more and more thinly peaked along this sort of um, x equals y line. Right? And so here are the contours says that you know x and y tend to grow together, and the large the things with large probability are if you know either x one is large and y two is large, or x one is small and y two is small, or somewhere in between. And uh, as this entry 0.8 gets large, you get a Gaussian distribution that's sort of where all the probability lies on this sort of um, narrow region where x is approximately equal to y. Kind of there's a very tall, thin distribution, you know, lying mostly along this um, line mostly along this central region where x is close to y. So this is if we set these entries to be positive entries. In contrast, if we set these to negative values, as I you know, decrease this to minus 0.5 down to minus 0.8, then what we get is a model where we put most of the probability in this sort of negative uh, x1 and x2 correlation region. And so most of the probability now lies in this region where x1 is about equal to minus x2 rather than uh, x1 equals x2. And so this captures a sort of negative correlation between x1 and x2. And so this is a, hopefully this gives you a sense of the different distributions that a multivariate Gaussian distribution can capture. So far we've been varying the covariance matrix sigma. The other thing you can do is also vary the uh, mean parameter mu and so originally we had mu equals 0, 0 and so the distribution was centered around x1 equals 0, x2 equals 0 so the peak of the distribution is here right? whereas if we vary the values of mu then that varies the peak of the distribution so if mu equals 0, 0 0.5 the peak is at you know x1 equals 0 and x2 equals 0 0.5 and so the peak or the center of this distribution has shifted and uh, if mu was you know 1.5 minus 0.5 then again similarly the peak of the distribution has now shifted to a different location corresponding to where you know x1 is 1.5 and x2 is minus 0.5 and so varying the mu parameter just shifts around the center of this whole distribution so hopefully looking at all these different pictures gives you a sense of the sort of probability distributions that the multivariate Gaussian distribution allows you to capture. And the key advantage of it is it allows you to capture when you'd expect two different features to be positively correlated or maybe negatively correlated. In the next video, we'll take this multivariate Gaussian distribution and apply it to anomaly detection.